manner. Manor Post delivers exclusives to your email inbox every Saturday morning. One post per week could include important news updates, the latest developments on productions, exclusive discounts, previews of upcoming releases, and so much more. Plus, every single post will come with the macabre menu, a schedule of Manor Entertainment's programming for the upcoming week. Go to ManorHQ.com and fill out the subscription form on the homepage. Join the rapid growing list of subscribers by adding your name at ManorHQ.com. Follow Manor online and on social media. You can find Manor on Twitter at Official Manor, on Instagram at Manor Entertainment, on YouTube at Manor Entertainment and on the official website address, mannerhq.com. As always, share with others and spread the word. Warning. The following program may contain violence, explicit language, sexual situations, and dark content, unsuitable for some listeners. It is intended for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. Presented in Cinematic Audio. Phil Gardner waited three minutes before turning the TV off. He would have done it sooner, but one of the Weather Channel's field correspondents was dancing and hooting on a Boston street corner because it was thundering as it snowed, and Phil couldn't bring himself to look away. Oh, again, again, that's a twofer, that's a twofer, baby, yes! When it switched back to the studio, however, he quickly lost interest. He knew what they were going to say. Six to eighteen inches over the next two days. Then another possible four to six on Friday. You can have your five hundred million dollar jackpot in Powerball or whatever the heck it was, but I'll take this baby. Phil didn't know about that. But he did know that the snow was already nearly halfway to the first story windows. If it kept on, they'd be buried. Literally, buried. Phil wasn't claustrophobic, but the walls were beginning to close on him, nevertheless. Of course, that could have been simple cabin fever. It had been nearly a week since he arrived at the bed and breakfast on Pine Ridge Road. Nearly a week since the first storm rolled over central New Hampshire. The pantry was getting bare, and the other guests were beginning to bicker. Mr. Johnson got more potatoes than I did. Mrs. Baker complains too much. On and on and on. Fred Mansfield, the owner of the place, tried to walk into town the day before yesterday, but got as far as the main highway, an impressive two miles downhill, before the wind became too much. You couldn't even see the asphalt. It looked just like the field out back. That was troubling. If the highway department wasn't maintaining the roads... The TV was saying more than a million people across New England were in the dark, with another million or so expected to join in the coming days. They had power now, but Phil was almost certain it wouldn't last, 
not with the snow and wind. Presently, Phil laid back on the bed and stared up at the ceiling. Shadows pulled in the corners, along with the dust and cobwebs Mrs. Mansfield claimed weren't there. How long until the roof collapsed? The thought was sudden, almost as if transmitted from an external source. How long until the beams gave way and all that snow came crashing down? Phil sighed. This was the worst hunt he'd ever been on. Philip Gardner was a businessman, and his business, nay, his passion, was the paranormal. In the 20 years since he started his own investigations into the unexplained, he had been on nearly 200 expeditions all over the world, from Italy to Mexico City to Beijing. He'd also authored three books on the subject, two of which made the New York Times bestseller list. If things panned out here, he planned to write another, this one dedicated entirely to the Wiltshire Bed and Breakfast, most haunted inn in New England. The thing was, he hadn't found anything. Nothing on the cameras, nothing on the EVP machine, not even one lousy cold spot. The stories, though, they were the stuff of legends, voices, footsteps, disembodied heads floating over you in the middle of the night, their eyes glazed and their lips dripping blood. It took him nearly three years to convince the owners, Fred and Martha Mansfield, to let him study the place. Three years of phone calls and emails three years of asking politely and outright begging. We'd look like kooks, Fred said, as if they didn't already. The sign out front pretty much marked them. You don't have to talk to me. I'll just do my investigating and that's it. No interviews, no quotes, nothing. Everything they told him was off the record, though he supposed he could slip it in as having been reported by someone else and he figured he might. Fred and Martha had some juicy stuff, hands grabbing their ankles as they got out of bed at night and such. The readers loved that kind of junk, even if it wasn't true. Phil, well, Phil didn't mind exaggerating occasionally, if it helped sales. But as Fred and Martha got further into their story, Phil realized he wouldn't have to embellish. It was wild enough as it stood. I think it's a demon. The way stuff just flies around, and the cat. Phil choked at the word demon. He wasn't a religious man by any means, but he did believe that there were evil spirits existing outside the realm of the living. Powerful evil spirits. If a demon had found its way into the Wiltshire, oh boy. What about the cat? Back in the 80s, Martha claimed, they had a cat named Smuckers. With a name like Smuckers, it has to be good. One day, poor Smuckers went missing. Martha looked everywhere. Two days later, he came crawling out of the woods. His body smashed and his brain seeping out of his ears. She figured he got hit by a car and dragged himself home. He was probably at it the whole two days. Shortly after he came home, Smuckers died, and Fred buried him in the yard. Later that night, Martha heard something. It was eerie, echoing through the house. It sounded like scratching. Scratching on the back door. When she opened it, Smuckers was there, one of his eyes hanging on a stalk of nerves. He meowed, and it was the strangest thing, his voice was really deep. The first thing the cat did was try to attack her foot. Fred jumped in, squishing his head, 
but he still kept coming. Finally, I grabbed him by the scruff of his neck and took him outside and burned him in the fire pit. (sighs) I think a demon got into him. Phil doubted the story, though his doubts had their own doubts. Demonic possession happens, yes, but it's rare. Demonic possession of a dead thing, well, that was rarer still. Some in the field believed that a corpse was simply an empty vessel that a demon, if powerful enough, could inhabit. Phil knew people, people he trusted, who had all sorts of wild stories about demonic possession. He believed them. He had just never seen it himself. If there were a demon, however, Phil would have known by now. As far as he was concerned, there was nothing to work with here. He would have packed up and gone home four days ago, but that's when the first storm blew through, cutting the Wiltshire off from the outside world. Sighing, Phil sat back up and rolled his neck. It was three in the afternoon, and the wind was beginning to pick back up, howling in the eaves like the voice of the damned. Dinner would be soon. He should probably... Yeah? It's me, Fred. We have a problem. Hey, New York, New York, a wonderful town. I wish you were here in beautiful Florida. Elizabeth Miller, what a great name, Elizabeth. And she is from Lynchburg, Virginia, 108 years old today. And she says, staying active, that's the secret. You live to be a hundred. Edith Baker, 91, lay in her bed, her mouth slack and her eyes open, staring sightlessly into the gloom. Phil grabbed her wrist to check for a pulse, and her skin was ice cold. She's dead. Fred Mansfield's face went white. Jesus! She was clad in a thin silk nightgown, indicating to Phil that she never got up that morning. It wasn't uncommon for the old gal to sleep in, so no one worried when she didn't show promptly at dawn. What do you think did it? Hmm, I don't know. Could have been a heart attack, stroke, brain aneurysm. Mrs. Baker was Martha Mansfield's first grade teacher. They remained close throughout the years, and when Mr. Baker died in 1998, Martha insisted Mrs. Baker come and live with them. It was either that or a nursing home. For being 91, Mrs. Baker was in pretty good health. She was the one who kept the garden nice and pretty. She was the one who did the wash and cleaned the bathrooms every week. Fred and Martha begged her to stop, but the old woman would only say, Buzz off, I'm earning my keep. Now she was dead. What are we going to do? I don't know, we can't call anyone. The phone lines were down, and cell service was non-existent on a good day, much less during a snow apocalypse, We could put her in the cellar. That would work. When the storm let up, one of them could walk into town and get help. All right. You should probably tell your wife first. Yeah. While Fred went off to break the news to Martha, Phil covered Mrs. Baker with a sheet and drew a chair to her bedside. The door was open. Fred really should have closed it. And when Mr. Johnson walked by, he turned and gawked. Oh my God, what happened? A tall, chubby man of fifty-some, with short, iron-gray hair and glasses. Ben Johnson was an accountant from Boston. Every so often, he came out to the B&B for a few days to unwind. Had been since 1990, Fred told him. To say he was close to the Mansfields and Mrs. Baker would be a stretch, but he certainly knew them. I don't know. Fred found a heart attack, probably. Ben shook his head. Jesus, what are we going to do with her? Cellar. Fred returned. Behind him, Marcus Warner strained for a look. 
Oh, shit. Tall and lean, Marcus used to be a football player, from what Phil heard. The New England Patriots drafted him back in 2005, but he didn't make the final cut. These days, he... Phil wasn't sure what he did, but he had to do something, right? Oh man. You're putting her in the cellar? Have to. What else are we gonna do? Marcus, you help me with her. Marcus nodded. Fred grabbed her arms, and Marcus caught her feet. The others stood aside as they carried her out of the room and down the stairs. In the living room, Martha Mansfield sat stiffly on the sofa. Next to her, Wanda Sines did her level best to provide comfort. When Phil walked in, Martha looked up, unshed tears standing in her eyes. What do you think it was? I don't know. Heart attack, probably. It looked like she went peacefully. Martha drew a big, watery breath and said, Thank God for small favors. Wanda rubbed Martha's shoulder. She's in a better place now. At 16, Wanda Sines was the sort of girl men went to jail for. Tall, olive skin, almond eyes, long black hair. She was Martha's niece, or third cousin, or something like that. Phil wasn't clear. She's in a better place. Yeah, the root cellar. Phil almost smiled. Instead, he went into the kitchen. The door to the cellar stood open, and Fred's voice rang distantly out. Set her down, nice and easy. Phil went down the stairs, avoiding the fifth one. It's weak, so be careful if you ever have to go down there. The cellar was 20 feet by 20 feet, with a dirt floor and cold stone walls. A long bench in the corner that may have once been part of a workshop served as a makeshift resting place. The white, wrapped woman lay stiff and jagged. Fred, Marcus, and Ben stood around, the former two huffing and puffing. Apparently, she was heavy. She should be fine in here. When this storm blows over, I'll go into town. I could go now. It's too windy. You'll never make it. It's only four miles, right? I can do that easy. I don't think you can. Hell, I don't think anybody can. I can. Fred looked at Phil. If he thinks he can make it, better that than leaving her down here. He thought, but didn't add. (sighs) All right. Back upstairs, Phil sank into one of the kitchen chairs and watched as Ben started a pot of coffee. They were down to their last couple rounds. They still had plenty of cocoa, though, so that evened out. This is a nightmare. You can say that again. Through the window, over the sink, whiteness prevailed. You think he can really make it? Phil opened his mouth to reply, but stopped. He didn't know. Marcus was young and strong. If anyone could make it, it would be him. I hope so. When the coffee was ready, Ben poured some into a mug and sat it on the table in front of Phil. He poured another two mugs and went into the living room. When he came back, he said, (sighs) Mrs. Mansfield's taking it better than I expected. That's good. The last thing we need is someone going into hysterics. Yeah, I wouldn't blame her, I guess. Mrs. Baker was like a mother to her. I wouldn't either, but we have enough on our plate. Just then, Fred and Marcus returned. Marcus dressed in a faded maroon snowsuit and a black ski mask. He sat and Fred started attaching his snowshoes to the bottom of his boots. That looks uncomfortable. It ain't too bad. Now when you got all your gear on, and you're playing in the heat, that's bad. Done, Marcus stood up and dragged himself through the living room. Fred, Phil, and Ben followed. 
at the door, Fred clapped Marcus's shoulder. Be careful out there. If you don't think you can make it, come back. All right. If you aren't back by... I'll be back. I promise you that. He opened the door and a cold gust blew in. Then he was gone. What time is it? Phil checked his watch. Five. Fred was standing at the sink, a second cup of coffee in his hand. Phil and Ben were at the table, working on their second as well. It's getting dark. I hope he gets back soon. He'll be fine. Blacks were bred for hard work. Fred and Phil both looked up at him. It's true. They lapsed into silence. Fred watched out the window, his face hard and set. Phil finished off his coffee and leaned back in his chair. Ben, chastised, stared down into his cup like a gypsy divining tea leaves. Well, I suppose I better start dinner. A muffled crash cut him off. Phil jumped and Ben looked up. What was that? I don't know. It sounded like it came from... Shit! What? Fred shook his head. I think the bench collapsed. The one Mrs. Baker's on. It dawned on Phil. It had looked a little... aged. It wouldn't take much for it to go, especially factoring in the nay supernatural heaviness of dead weight. An image of the old woman, wrapped in white, lying amidst splinters and broken boards, flashed across Phil's mind. Fred, what was that? Fred licked his lips. Nothing. Martha didn't press the matter. We better go see the damage. Phil got up. Ben started to say something, but closed his mouth and went back to looking into his coffee. Phil went over to the cellar door and opened it. A cold blast washing over him. The light was on. He remembered turning it off. What's wrong? I could have sworn... A shadow flickered across the wall, followed by a shuffling footfall. Phil froze. What? The shadow grew smaller and denser as the source drew near. Between the ceiling and the banister, Phil caught a quick movement, and Mrs. Baker appeared. Jesus Christ! Her shoulders were stooped and her head hung. Her arms dangled limply at her sides. When he spoke, she looked up, her head flopping bonelessly back and terror washed over him. Her eyes were red, demonic. She smiled. Mrs. Baker? The old woman took one jerky step forward and threw her arms up as if to embrace them. Her face, Phil saw, half obscured by darkness, was blue and drawn. Her teeth, dear God, her teeth were long and jagged. <coughs> Phil panicked and slammed the door, throwing himself against it. What? Mrs. Baker, she's alive. That wasn't Mrs. Baker. What do you mean it wasn't Mrs. Baker? Martha and Wanda had appeared in the doorway. What's wrong? Mrs. Baker's alive. That wasn't Mrs. Baker. Mrs. Baker is dead. I checked her pulse. Her skin was cold. There's no way she's alive. She's possessed, just like Smuckers. Smuckers? But that was just a scary story. What? We made it up. You lied? Embellished. We had to say something. Phil sagged against the door, dark realizations breaking over him. You invited it in. What? Demonic spirits existed outside of humanity, in the ether, 
in the darkness. However, there were ways to bring them into the world. Ouija boards, seances, claiming a demon you didn't have, creating a role, an empty role, a role something could fill. You opened a door. You invited it in. Fred's face darkened. I've had enough of your new age psycho babble. Get the hell out of my way. Fred, listen to me. Fred pushed Phil aside. Fred! Fred opened the door. Fred! And Mrs. Baker was on him. Her long, bony fingers digging into the sides of his face as she bit his neck. Martha screamed. Ben jumped up from his chair. Fred wailed as Mrs. Baker tore out his throat. He thrashed and pounded his fist against her head and back, but she continued unfazed. Phil was frozen. He couldn't move. Oh my god! Yum yum, yum Freddy! She let go of Fred, and he toppled back. His face was almost completely white. For a moment, the ghoul stood where it was, licking the blood from its blue lips. Realizing there were others, she moved towards Martha, but Phil came to life. He grabbed her by the collar of her gown and yanked her back, almost unbalancing her. She was strong. She ripped free of his grasp and turned on him. More me! She fell on him, but he was quicker. He spun with her and shoved, sending her flying down the cellar stairs with a sickening crack. She was up in an instant, her neck twisted and broken. Phil slammed the door shut and threw himself against it. Martha and Ben were kneeling over Fred, Martha sobbing. Fred's eyes were opened, but he struggled to breathe. His neck was ruined. Blood was everywhere. Jesus Christ, it looked like bush gardens in hell. Give me a chair. Ben pushed the chair over and Phil caught it. Just as he shoved the back under the doorknob, it turned. Phil backed away. The knob rattled and shook. Shuddering, Phil wiped his hands on his pants. He touched it. Jesus Christ, he touched it. Fred! Phil looked back at Fred. He wasn't going to make it, even if they could just call 911. And then, at the door, the knob was rattling. The Edith Baker thing was trying to get out. I can no, smell your penis. I, I want it. Phil swooned. This couldn't be happening. It couldn't. Ben and Phil lugged Fred into the living room and onto the sofa. His eyes were starting to glaze. He was dead, or close. Martha was sobbing. Wanda was crying. Ben was white. When Phil dragged him back into the kitchen, he looked around like he'd never seen the place before. He was in shock. I... I... I don't... The shred of a gun... A gun? Yes, a gun. I... I think so. Yeah. Yeah. He's a hunter. Go get it. Ben nodded and rushed off. Phil turned to the door. The knob was silent now. If Mrs. Baker was still there, she wasn't trying to escape. Yet. Ben returned with a double-barrel shotgun and a box of shells. Phil took it, cracked the stock and slipped two of the bright red cartridges into the breech. With that, he snapped it closed and cocked it. What, what's happening? Mrs. Baker? That wasn't Mrs. Baker. What was it? Something else. Outside, the wind howled. 
The power dimmed. Ben looked up. He started to speak, but in the living room, Martha wailed. Fred! <laughs> Fred was most likely gone. Listen to me. I want you to take Martha and Wanda upstairs. Your room, my room, whatever, just lock the door. Put a dresser in front of it. Make sure nothing can get through, okay? Okay. okay. Good. The power went out at 7.21 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on February 17th, 2015. Phil was sitting in a kitchen chair facing the cellar door when it cut out, plunging the house into darkness. Outside, the wind moaned. Phil's grip tightened on the gun. Fred Mansfield lay still in the living room. Phil didn't like having his back to the man, but he doubted he'd rise. For the most part, the house was quiet. Ben and the women were upstairs still, and the doorknob hadn't moved in nearly a half hour. Let me out! Let me out! I want to eat your skin! It wasn't coming from behind the cellar door. It was coming from the middle of his own head. No! The demon banged on the door, shaking it in its frame. Let me out, let me out, let me out. He hoped Marcus got back soon. Marcus is dead. Shut up! <laughs> the back door blew open, slamming against the wall. A swirl of wind driven snow danced into the kitchen. Just the wind, Phil told himself as he tried to calm his racing heart. He got up, closed it, and came back to the chair. He was just sitting down when a sharp, echoing knocking filled the house. Marcus. Phil got up and went to the door. I hope to God he found help. He unlatched the door, and the wind ripped it out of his hands. Phil's relief evaporated. Marcus was hunched over as if under a great weight. His black face was crusted with ice and flecks of snow, and his eyes were the color of blood. Told you I'd be back. Phil screamed and brought the gun up. Marcus moved to knock it away, but he was too slow. Phil fired. The Marcus thing staggered back and went down. Phil slammed the door and latched it again. When he turned, he nearly screamed. Fred, his shirt and gaping neck, caked with blood, was standing behind him, his face slack and his eyes red. The cellar door slammed open and Mrs. Baker appeared behind him. So hungry. So cold. Phil raised the gun and fired. The shot took Fred in the face, knocking him aside. Mrs. Baker came flying forward. Thinking fast, Phil swung the gun like a club, the stock connected with her head. Phil backed to the bottom of the stairs to the second floor. Mrs. Baker was getting to her feet, her head split and her brains falling out. Fred was already on his feet again. His head was obliterated. Marcus pounded at the front door. Give us your skin. Give us your hands. Phil bolted up the stairs. At the top, he slipped two more shells into the shotgun. Fred and Mrs. Baker were at the bottom of the stairs now. Phil aimed the gun, but before he could fire, Wanda Sines leapt from the shadows, knocking the gun away. Yeah. Phil elbowed her in the face, knocking her against the wall. Frantic now, he grabbed the shotgun and brought it around. The first shot took her in the stomach, leaving a giant red crater. The second decapitated her and flung her down the stairs. He tried to load the gun again, but the shell dropped from his trembling hands and rolled away. 
Martha Mansfield and Ben Johnson appeared from the darkness. Shit! Ben came toward him, his arms outstretched, and Phil swung the gun, striking him in the temple and knocking him back. Martha hissed and threw herself forward. Phil ducked around her and swung the gun, hitting her in the back and driving her to her knees. There was nowhere to go. He was trapped. They were all in the hallway now. Marcus, Fred, Mrs. Baker, Wanda, Ben, Martha. Their eyes glowed crimson and their fingers clutched. Marcus chuckled and Martha growled. God help me. He tried to load the gun again, but they were on top of him. He threw it into the crowd and ducked into Mrs. Baker's room. Inside, he slammed the door, locked it, and leaned his weight against it. He was breathing so hard, he was lightheaded. He looked hysterically around for a weapon. Something. Anything. The window. They were at the door now, pounding, and he fought to keep his balance. It wouldn't hold for long. God help me. Moving quick, weasel-like, Phil went for the window. The door crashed open behind him. Hours later, Philip Gardner settled into a snowbank overlooking State Route 10 and listened to the wind. He wasn't cold anymore. In fact, he was warm. The terror, too, had gone, and right before he closed his eyes and went to sleep, he couldn't remember why he was so afraid in the first place. After all, it was only snow. been listening to Manor House, episode 21, Snowbound, presented in cinematic audio. Subscribe to this show and leave a rating, a review, and general feedback wherever you're receiving this program. Share with others on social media and at home. Your feedback, as well as sharing with others, helps grow and continue future productions. Credits. This episode was originally recorded and produced in 2016. Performances by Aiko as Philip, Christopher Ford as Fred, Tisha Boone as Martha and Wanda, Rock Capuano as Ben and Marcus. Story by Joseph Rubus. Directed, produced, edited, and scripted by Rock Capuano. Music, audio, and sound design provided by Edel SFX. Theme song by Alan Postscript, based on The Shining by The Angelas. Cover art by Mads B. Henriksen. Manor House was created by Rock Capuano. Manor House is a Manor Entertainment production. The story, all names, characters, and incidents portrayed in this production are fictitious. No identification with actual persons, living or deceased, places, buildings, and products is intended or should be inferred. This production is property of Manor Entertainment, LLC. No portion of this production may be reproduced or used by any means without the proper written consent of Manor Entertainment, LLC. This production is protected under the copyright laws of the United States and other countries throughout the world. Country of first publication, United States of America. Any unauthorized exhibition, distribution, or copying of this production or any part thereof may result in civil liability and criminal prosecution. Copyright 2019. 
Manor Entertainment, LLC. Manor.